Namaste. Namaste. Buenos dias. Karibuni. Bonjour. And welcome everyone as we begin our prayer together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. May the love and peace and joy of the risen Jesus be with all of you. Amen. And as we come together to worship on the Sabbath weekend, we acknowledge with gratitude and humility that we are on the territory of the Onondaga Nation, land which our indigenous sisters and brothers have recognized as sacred and have cared for since time in the morning. And so as we come together on another beautiful summer weekend, our gospel challenges us uh, very, very interestingly on what are the walls, the barriers, the boundaries uh, that divide us as a human community. So let us take a moment thanking God that we're all created in God's image and likeness. Let us pray for the melting down of all those things that divide us. As we pray, Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. O God of all the nations, to your table all are invited, and in your family no one is a stranger. Satisfy the hunger of those gathered remotely, those gathered in this house of prayer, and mercifully extend to all people on earth the joy of salvation and faith. And grant this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and loves with you in the unity of the Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. Reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. <clears throat> Thus says I, do what is right, work for justice. For my liberation is about to come, and my justice is about to be revealed. For thus says Yahweh, the foreigners who join themselves to me, ministering to me, loving the name of Yahweh, and becoming my servants. All who observe the Sabbath and do not profane it, and cling to my covenant. These I will bring to my holy mountain, I will make them joyful in my house of prayer. The word of the Lord. Thanks. 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 Thanks.
The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. I say this now to you Gentiles, inasmuch as I am the apostle to the Gentiles, I glory in my ministry, trying to rouse my own people to jealousy and save some of them. For if their rejection has meant reconciliation for the world, what will their acceptance mean? Nothing less than life from the dead. God's gift and God's call are irrevocable. Just as you were once disobedient to God and now have received mercy through Israel's disobedience, now they have become disobedient since God wished to show you mercy, that they too may receive mercy. God has imprisoned all in disobedience in order to have mercy on everyone. The Word of God. Thank you, Thank you She then prostrated herself before him with the plea, Help me, Rabbi. He answered, But it's not right to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. True, Rabbi, she replied, But even the dogs eat the scraps that fall from the table. Jesus then said in reply, Woman, you have great faith. Your wish will come to pass. And at that very moment, her daughter was healed. Imaniya monumke mkukananayo. Yesu aliondoka huko aende katika sehemu za Tiro na Sidoni. Hapo monumke mkanana alikuja kutoka eneo lile. Akaita Kwa sauti kubwa, uni hurumie bwana, mwana wa Daudi. Binti yake, binti yangu, ana zumbuliwa sana na pepo mbaya. Lakini, hakumjibu neno. Wafuwasi wake, wakamuendea, wakamuomba, wakisema, mwache aende zake. Kwa mana, anatufuata kwa kilele. Akajibu, nimetumwa kwa kondo wa potevu, wa nyumba ya Israeli tu. Naye, akaja, akamsujudia, akasema, buwana unisaitie. Akamjibu, si vizuri kuchukua chakula cha watoto na kuwatupia 
vijibwa naye akasema ndio bwana lakini hata vijibwa ula makombo ya kukukayo katika meza za bwana wao hapo Yesu akajibu akamwambia mama imani yako ni kubwa utendewe kama utakavyo tangu saa ile binti yake akawa mzima the good news of salvation we praise you lord jesus christ The journalist and teacher of peace, Coleman McCarthy, once asked his students to write an essay grappling with the question, why are we violent but not illiterate? Just think about that for a couple seconds. McCarthy holds up one response of a student for both its depth of insight and brevity. The student wrote, we are not illiterate because we're taught to read. We're not illiterate because we're taught to read. If you think about it, it's clear. Everything in our culture and social worlds operates on the presumption that a newborn will read and write and comprehend language. And by the time a child is a toddler, if they're not demonstrating the capacity for these skills, we bring out our most serious experts from the fields of medicine, behavioral science, and education to diagnose and remedy or accommodate the situation. And lo and behold, by the time they are 15 years old, the vast majority of Americans, some 90 plus percent, are what is called functionally literate. McCarthy's point, of course, was less about literacy, but rather what might be the outcome if we lived in a society in which everything operated on the presumption that all children, all people, would be nonviolent. If every encounter with our infants, toddlers, children, partners, spouses, and friends, with everyone, was rooted in the expectation of nonviolence, and if anyone didn't demonstrate a capacity for that skill, we'd bring in resources to work with them to remedy the situation. What a world that might be. This week, as I was pondering the gospel, I've also been working with our stewards of justice and peace on formulating our parish's commitment to anti-racism with input from numbers of parishioners, so we thank you for that. McCarthy's question kept coming into my mind in a kind of revised fashion. Why are we racist but not illiterate? While the answer remains essentially the same, our growing awareness of the pervasive and ever-present reality of unconscious racism has increasingly drawn our attention to the fact that at base, becoming anti-racist requires unlearning a whole host of attitudes, beliefs, and resulting behaviors, which are embedded in the culture and language we so eagerly teach and learn. It is toward confronting this unconscious dimension within each and all of us, as well as in the systems and structures in which we live, that efforts labeled anti-racist are directed. This is a daunting task. How do we give up something that we're not aware that we have? This requires real work. We need to leave our comfort zone in order to see what makes us comfortable. If you think about it for a minute, think about what you absolutely must pack when you go camping. Do you have to bring toilet paper? Or can you camp without it? Our gospel this week couldn't be more helpful or perhaps challenging as we all take up this daunting task. In Matthew's story today, we find Jesus crossing boundaries of several kinds, regional, cultural, religious, and moral going to where he is a stranger, and doing what for many of us may seem to be strange things. We find him ultimately healing, yes, but also 
changing and growing on the journey, learning and also unlearning some of his cultural baggage. And if I may be so bold, if Jesus, Lord, Son of David, and heir to the throne, can demonstrate a change of mind, I think there's great hope for all of us. To best understand this gospel episode, we need to remember that it follows a description of the enormous opposition that Jesus was encountering from the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Even though, actually maybe because, Jesus was performing amazing miracles of healing, the Pharisees could only find fault with him. Jesus got frustrated. Just a little earlier in Matthew's Gospel, Jesus calls them hypocrites and blind guides. Jesus decides to leave the city and head north, up to the region of Tyre and Sidon. These, were the city, these cities were in Phoenicia, territory that was primarily Gentile. As he traveled through the area, a Canaanite woman sought him out. The Canaanites were a pagan people with a long history of conflict with Israel. This woman, however, wasn't concerned about their differences. She must have known something of Jesus and his reputation as a healer. She refers to him as Lord and heir of David. However, it was that she knew him. When she found herself in a terrible personal crisis, she called upon him. Consider her situation. She is, first of all, a woman. Apparently on her own, there's no mention of husband or sons. Rather, her child is merely a daughter and even more demon-possessed, a di disease in a way that isolated them and made people afraid and assumed that they had sinned. There really wasn't a lower rung on the ranking scale to which she could fall. She quite literally had no place to turn. Interestingly, in this scene, both Jesus and the woman are adrift in their lives rejected by the conventional, established societies from which they had come, both seeking understanding and help. When they actually meet face to face, the woman cries out for pity, for mercy, for salvation. Her complete lack of inhibition, her willingness to defy the gender, ethnic, and religious barriers between them surely spoke volumes. She's willing to throw all propriety to the winds, to humble herself publicly, all for the love of her lost child. But what happens next makes us uncomfortable, doesn't it? Jesus gave her no word of response, complete silence. What was he pondering in that moment of encounter? She then badgers the disciples, thinking Jesus would listen to them. They plead with him to deal with her problem in order to get rid of her, to dismiss her. She had become an uncomfortable annoyance. Jesus replies that his mission is to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Simply put, he says he must focus on Jews, the chosen ones, his own, not Gentiles. But therein lies a problem, for the chosen ones are rejecting him failing to hear his message of justice and inclusion that challenges their systems and structures, their hierarchy of domination. This foreign woman, however, inspired by the great needs of her child, instead of getting angry and leaving in a huff, kneels down before him, saying, help me, Rabbi. We think, surely now, Jesus will grant this woman's request, she has moved from a loud, insistent begging to a quiet posture of humility at his feet. How can he resist her? We aren't prepared for his answer. It is not right to take the food of the children and throw it to the dogs. Ouch! Jesus is using a domestic metaphor. The children are, of course, the Jews, members of God's covenantal family. Jews referred to pagans as dogs because of the contrast between what they saw as their own well-developed ethical system versus what they viewed as the primitive idolatry of the pagans. People outside of God's covenant were to the Jews as dogs are to people. 
This was simply a matter of priorities. In family life, the children must be fed before the pet dogs. This is just common sense or unconscious racism. Still, in the story, the woman does not resist what Jesus says to her. She knows what the Jews think of the Canaanites. She also knows that she has no reason to expect or demand anything from him. And she knows she has nothing to lose. She doesn't contradict Jesus. She simply takes what he says, and out of desperate, unbounded love of her child, in humility, points out that in the domestic scene that he has described, crumbs fall from the children's table and the dogs are ever so happy to lap them up and to be nourished by them. What a moment of encounter. This Canaanite woman, this pagan outsider, has exhibited the kind of faith that even the Jerusalem elites failed to muster. Both Jesus and the woman live on behalf of others. Jesus as prophet sent to save a people, and the woman as a mother who cares daily for someone in desperate need. In this moment, they and we discover that they have much in common, these two strangers meeting outside the bounds of conventional society. This woman, in her need, her love for another, encounters Jesus as Lord. Her faith and hope are born of the spirit, not religious tradition or ethnic identity brought forth through her daughter's suffering and their marginalization. Jesus is astounded at her faith, her acknowledgement of him and who he is, as an outsider, a Canaanite, a Greek, a Syrophoenician, not a Jew, not a lost sheep, just a woman who loves her child, a human being in need, someone willing to humble herself to beg for another's healing and she is like him. Now Jesus not only responds to her, he praises her. This woman, as he calls her, using a term of honor and respect, indeed has great faith. Perhaps more than his own people, he speaks to her directly with no note of condensation. Your wish will come to pass. In that moment, her hope and belief bursts into reality. She leaves Jesus and goes to find her daughter healed. From here, Jesus moves on too, along the Sea of Galilee, drawing large crowds, healing and feeding those in need. He moves on, not just from the encounter and geographic place, but from the world he thought he came for and belonged to, Jesus sinless human person that he is, moves from a culturally bound understanding of himself as called only to the house of Israel. Now he moves on, knowing that his mission is to the world, all the peoples on earth, all the lost children of God, no boundaries, no conditions. This story is critical to how we imagine Jesus, isn't it? Because if we imagine that Jesus never doubted, never questioned, never learned from anyone or from the world around him, never changed his mind, then that's what we value and imitate. But if we take this story at face value and accept that Jesus, fully human in all things but sin, does listen, learn, and change and grow even recognizes his cultural biases, then that is the example of a godly life. Jesus' encounter with the Canaanite woman calls us, as individuals and as community of disciples, to a deeper belief and a change of heart and attitude. It means that we too, as individuals, as a church, as society, are to follow him across borders into unknown territory to become willing to be a stranger in somebody else's world. It means that we listen to those we'd rather dismiss, or who challenge us, or who make us uncomfortable. We open ourselves to them, and we humble ourselves, confess and repent when we're wrong, 
And it means that we too keep learning, and when necessary, unlearning, and growing for the rest of our lives. And keep looking for the ways God is stretching us and our mission to create the inclusive and just and healing kingdom of God on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Meg, for the excellent, excellent message. With faith in the humility of the Canaanite woman, we now bring our needs to our unconditionally loving and accepting God. Please respond, compassionate God, receive our prayer. Compassionate God, receive our prayer. For Pope Francis, all the hierarchy and all the people of God, that together we open ourselves fully to the divine leading us to conform ever more fully to the mind of Christ, we pray. Compassionate God, receive our prayer. For wisdom for public authorities at this pivotal time in our nation and community, that they place the common good above all other interests, we pray. Compassionate God, receive our prayer. As our parish discerns a commitment to become an anti-racist community, that we be enabled through prayer, dialogue, and reflection to let go of whatever keeps us from embracing the inherent dignity of all God's children, we pray. Compassionate God, receive our prayer. For all students, faculty, and administrators returning to our colleges and university campuses, that they remain healthy and that their teaching and learning be fruitful in this time when insight-based and well-founded knowledge is so critical to our future as a nation and world, we pray. Compassionate God, receive our prayer. For all our essential workers, that they be constantly renewed in spirit and steadfast courage, and know how very much they are appreciated we pray. Compassionate God, receive our prayer. For those sick with or recovering from COVID-19, including our John Habari Reina and Father Robert Yezo, and, and for all who are ill and in need of prayer, especially our Marian Kupit, Kathy Briggs' brother Kirk, Cynthia Barnett, Pat Peterson, Dick Navinger, Rosemary Lewis, Marcia Reynard, and our Lauren Hardy Chase's cousin Yvonne. And for an end to the pandemic, we pray. For all who have died, that they rest in the joy and peace of God's eternal embrace, and especially for Father Richard Delos, a priest of our diocese who died on Tuesday from the COVID-19 virus, our Michael O'Toole, Michael Yost, Frank and Lottie Cardacci, for whom this Mass is being offered, we pray. Compassionate God, receive our prayer. For all in our community in any kind of need, for the intentions in our intention book and prayer chain, with special commemoration at this Mass of our Tim and the 
late Molly Voorhees' wedding anniversary and for the intentions we each hold in our heart, we pray. Almighty and eternal God, receive the prayers we make through Jesus, who lives and loves with you in the unity of the Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen.
are grateful. We bring you these simple gifts of bread and wine, praying that you send your spirit upon them, that they may become for us the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, who on the night before he died gathered with the disciples for a common meal. And while they were at table, he took bread and said the blessing. He broke the bread and shared it with the disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat it. This is my body, which will be given up for you. And towards the end of the meal, Jesus took a cup of wine. And lifting the cup to his Father, he said, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. This is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant. It will be shed for you and for all, so that sin may be forgiven. Do this in memory. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith.
Sisters and brothers, may the body and the blood of Christ bring us all to everlasting life. in solidarity with our sisters and brothers who cannot receive communion physically. We share this prayer of spiritual commitment. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things, and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. Again, a big thank you for your wonderful generosity that is keeping us, uh, not only keeping us going, but helping us to uh, continue to uh, do all the, all the ministries that God is calling us to do during this difficult time. Uh, also, as mentioned in the prayers of the faithful, um, all of our families are in prayer as they prepare heading back to school. We pray for the children and parents and school administrators and principals and teachers and uh, all involved during this very, very difficult time. And we have a wonderful news that our Doris Jackson uh, this past week celebrated her 95th birthday and uh, she's doing great. Uh, she got through the COVID so far and still lives in her own home and uh, is a breath of fresh air uh, to our community. So Doris, if you're watching, we're looking forward to the 100th uh, birthday <laughs> in a few years. So let us conclude our prayer. O oh God of love, through this Holy Eucharist, you make us one body in Christ. Fashion us in his likeness here on earth, that we may be ready to share his company in heaven, who lives and loves forever and ever. Amen. And my friends, the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. And may Almighty God watch over us and bless us, the Father, the Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Our liturgy is ended. Let us really enjoy this upcoming week by jumping in the lake or whatever we do on these great summer days. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God.
I know your favor forgives all our sins Not by our faith or the color of our skin But in my privilege, foolish pride The love God gave, I chose to hide God started the fire, created the dust From one single star, made all of us From the air that we breathe to the water we share From every fingernail to each strand of hair We are one body and one dying sun Help us remember, Lord, we are all one And go in love and share God's grace See the Lord in every face Go in love and share God's grace See the Lord in every face See the Lord in every face You said, follow me, even across the raging sea. But when I see a man who's different than me, the best I can do is just cross the street. You know my fault and many sins, and still you choose to take me in. Even when others have it so bad, you bless me with this good life I have. Lord, you gave your life for me. Help me cross this raging sea and go in love and share God's grace. See the Lord in every face. Go in love and share God's grace. See the Lord in every face. See the Lord in every face. Go in love and share God's grace. See the Lord in every face. Go in love and share God's grace. See the Lord in every face. Lord, in my shame I closed my eyes I built a wall and ignored their cries With fear and hate I built that wall It blocks your light and muffles your call I saw a child behind that wall And again I failed to hear your call When in despair that child died I still ignored their mournful cries Lord, I failed to hear your call Help me now tear down this wall and go in love and share God's grace. See the Lord in every face. Go in love and share God's grace. See the Lord in every face. See the Lord in every face. Go in love and share God's grace. See the Lord in every face. Go in love and share God's grace. See the Lord in every face. See the Lord in every face.